Welcome back, Albert here. Today, we will be talking about Ar Farazan, the 25th ruler of Numenor, the last king of Numenor. Farazan was born in the year 3118 SA and was the only child of Gimolcad, the younger brother of Tar Palantir, the 24th ruler of Numenor. Farazan's name means golden. He had a high elvish name too, Kalion, recorded as always in the scrolls of the king, dictated by tradition, but it would never be used in his life. In his youth, Farazan was described as a man of great beauty, strength and stature, an image of the kings of old, and strangely enough growing up, he was great friends with Amandil, one of the fateful Numenorians, held in high honour by many due to the high nobility of his house, something that is hard to believe. It implies Farazan was someone unashamed of his associations, and was very confident of his position even within the society he lived in, or perhaps a very clever individual politically. Only time will tell. After some time, Farazan departed Numenor to participate in the wars in Middle-earth that the king's men were waging against Sauron, and while in Middle-earth he became a great captain and commander of the Numenorean armies. He did not return to Numenor until 3243 SA. He did so when he found out about the early death of his father. When he returned, he was considered a great hero, famous to all Numenorians, enforced too by his great generosity with the wealth that he had acquired in Middle-earth. The hearts of the people were turned towards him, and perhaps to honour his father, or it was just who he was and what he believed, Farazan became the leader of the king's men, fighting against his uncle's reforms, who attempted to return to the ways of the Valar and the Eldar. A considerable blow to Tar Palantir, who had perhaps felt the death of his brother would bring an end to the internal struggle, or at the very least dampen the opposition. This was not to be. He remained a thorn in his uncle's side until the king's very death in 3255 SA. Following his uncle's death, he wedded Tar Palantir's only daughter, Miriel, by force, which was against the laws of his land that forbade marriage between first-degree cousins and seized the scepter of Numenor, thus usurping the throne from his new wife and rightful heir forcing her to take the title Ar Zimrapel and proclaiming himself king Ar Farazon and thus it was he became the 25th king of Numenor an upsetting outcome but since Miriel's father was not a popular ruler among their people it's not surprising that no one came to her aid and defended her right to rule it just shows the little respect her father had as ruler. Amandil, his longtime friend, would also gain early fame himself as a mighty ship captain, and after his own father's death, he would become the 18th Lord of Andunie, the leader of the faithful, and a member of the King's Royal Council, the Council of Scepter. He also had a son called Elendil, born in the year 3119 SA, someone very important to our story later on. I can imagine like many fateful Numenorean, Amandil was taken off guard by the marriage between Miriel and Farazan, and his illegal claim to the throne. But in his current position, there is little he could do to stop it. A bitter pill to swallow. After Farazan's unlawful ascent to power, he heard news that Sauron had been assailing the Numenorean settlements in Middle-earth since his return to the island. His master of ships and captains returning from the east explained to him that Sauron wished to drive the Numenorians back to the sea whence they had come, 
and declare himself king of men, and most of all, to destroy Numenor itself, if possible. The king became enraged upon hearing this news, and decided that he alone was worthy of that title, king of men, and he would make Sauron his servant. To accomplish this end, he spent five years preparing a great force, and in the year 3261 SA, he launched the Numenorean fleet. It is said men along the shore of Middle-earth saw his ship sails coming up out of the sunset, dyed as with scarlet and gleaming with red and gold, and fear fell upon those who dwelt by the coasts, and they fled far away. It was not long before the fleet landed at the haven of Umbar, the main haven of the king's men in the south. From there, the king and his army marched north to Mordor. For seven days he journeyed with banner and trumpet. Their splendor and might was so great that Sauron's own servants deserted him, so the lands were empty and quiet as the king's army marched upon Middle-earth. And upon a hill, looking down upon his enemies, the king of Numenor made camp. Surrounded by his great host, like a field of tall flowers, Ar Farazon sat upon his throne unopposed. And when he was ready, he sent forth heralds, and he commanded Sauron to come before him and swear to him fealty. Sauron came forth from his mighty tower of Baradur and made no offer of battle. Sauron now perceived that the power and majesty of the Numenor surpassed all rumor. He dared not trust even the greatest of his servants to withstand them. But Sauron was crafty and skilled in the art of manipulation especially when he knew he could not win by strength of arms. Therefore, Sauron changed into his fair form and humbled himself before the king. To all men, he seemed fair and wise. But the king was not yet deceived by Sauron's fair nature and decided there and then what he would do. To ensure the oath Sauron had just made for peace, the king stripped Sauron of his titles and decreed that he would be taken as a hostage to Numenor to keep his servants from harassing the Numenorians in Middle-earth. Sauron acted as if this decision upset him and assented as one constrained. But in his secret thought, he received it gladly as it furthered his plans to destroy the Numenorians, in retaliation for this humiliation. And thus it was, Sauron passed over the sea, and looked upon the land of Numenor, and on the city of Armenilos, in the days of its glory. One can only imagine Sauron's glee, when he was given free passage to Numenor, as a prisoner. And although at first, he was astonished, by the splendor of Numenor. His heart was filled even more with envy and hate. Sauron's arrival on the island was the doom of all, although they did not know it yet. And so it was he hid his purpose, and instead managed to gain relative freedom, and most importantly to his designs, access to the king. He played on the king's fears and desires, quickly gaining influence and a reputation for wisdom. His words echoed the very thoughts that Ar Farazon and several of his predecessors had harbored for many years. How the Valar were keeping immortality from them, and how the noble race of Numenor deserved better than the gift of death from Eru. The king soon responded in kind and made Sauron his chief advisor just three years after his coming to Numenor. Sauron soon became known 
a zigor, which meant wizard in Anduniac. A shocking turn of events indeed, but not hard to believe, as Sauron, along with his own natural talents, power and abilities, also bore the One Ring. He would have used his ring's influence to manipulate the king's mind, and later the majority of the Numenorean people. We must assume that the king lacked specific details or insight into the War of Eregion, the great war between the elves and Sauron. Otherwise, he would have kept his distance from the Dark Lord. But the Numenorians, except for the faithful, had for the most part estranged themselves from this historical elvish war with Sauron. In all likelihood, he was ignorant about the One Ring and its power. It's not hard to conceive that the details of the Rings of Power were not common knowledge anymore, or perhaps never were, unless one was friends with the highest seats of the Elvish Kingdom, which at this stage Numenorean kings were not. If he had known about the Ring's ability to dominate the wills of others to that of its master, Sauron would never have been allowed to set foot on Numenor, or at the very least, the king would have taken it off him during his defeat, and perhaps claimed it for himself, but this never came to pass. Sauron proceeded to teach the people of Numenor many things, and in most of his speeches he spoke against the Valar, which most Numenorians already feared and disliked. Eventually Sauron's teachings began to focus more upon darkness. Eventually, to the Numenorians, he said, Darkness alone is worshipful, and the Lord thereof may yet make other worlds to be gifts to those that serve him, so that the increase of their power shall find no end. These words eventually reached the ears of the king. The king then called him forth and asked Sauron in secret about the Lord of Darkness. The king asked, Who is the Lord of Darkness? Sauron lied, of course, and said, It is he whose name is not now spoken, for the Valar have deceived you concerning him, putting forward the name of Eru, a phantom devised in the folly of their hearts, seeking to enchain men in servitude to themselves, for they are the oracle of this Eru, which speaks only what they will. But he that is their master shall yet prevail, and he will deliver you from this phantom. And his name is Melkor, Lord of all, giver of freedom, and he shall make you stronger than they. This idea twisted the mind of the king with delusion and grandeur, and soon enough he began to worship the darkness and Melkor. He practiced his new religion in secret at first, but soon displayed it openly, and most of his people followed him. It's conceivable that the Numenorians who followed their king in this new practice didn't all believe at first. Why would they? But in the end, even they succumbed to either political pressure, fear, or Sauron's will. Seeing the favor bestowed upon Sauron, all of the king's counselors, save Armandil, began to fawn upon Sauron. Armandil was soon dismissed from the council, and he withdrew to Romena, where he secretly gathered all of the faithful. This was the final blow to long-held Numenorean traditions and beliefs, especially to the recently resurrected practice of the Three Prayers by Tar Palantir, praising Eru on Menel Tamar Mountain. This was completely abandoned. In fact, the king made it punishable by death if anyone tried. Not even Sauron dared to defile the mountain. 
thus bringing an end to the custom of making offerings to Eru on its summit, a tradition that has lasted some 3,000 years. But Sauron had only just begun. Given time, he then advised the king to destroy Nimloth, the white tree of Numenor, which was one of the last symbols of the Numenorians' ancient friendship with the Valar and the Aldar. The king was reluctant to do this because he had heard of Tar Palantir's prophecy that the line of kings would end when the tree perished. It's interesting even now the king is still struggling with some things asked of him. When Amundil heard rumour of the evil purpose of Sauron, he was heartbroken, knowing that in the end Sauron would convince the king to destroy the tree. He spoke to Elendil, his son, and the sons of Elendil, Isildur and Anarion, expressing what the tree meant to the Numenorean culture and reminding them of the old tales of the trees of Valinor. Inspired by what he heard, Isildur, without saying a word to anyone, went out that very night passing alone in disguise to Armenilos, Numenor's capital city, to the courts of the king. He came to the place of the tree, which was now forbidden to all by the orders of Sauron, watched day and night by guards in his service. At that time, Nimloth was dark and bore no bloom, for it was late in the autumn, and its winter was nigh. Isildur passed through, evaded the guards, and took from the tree a fruit that hung upon it. But unfortunately during his escape, the guards were aroused, and he was attacked. And although he received terrible wounds, he fought his way out, escaping with the fruit. Because he was disguised, no one knew it was him. Isildur met his way back to Romena and delivered the fruit to the hands of Amandil. A look of shock was probably on Amandil's face when Isildur offered him the fruit. It said the fruit was planted in secret and it was blessed by Amandil. And when its first leaves opened in the spring, they were used to heal Isildur, who had been close to death due to his wounds. It was not long after that Amandil's fears came to pass. The White Tree of Numenor was destroyed. Sauron had finally changed the mind of the king. In its place, they built a great temple in which Sauron and the king performed dark rituals such as human sacrifices, in the hope that the Lord of Darkness would save the Numenorians from death. Many of the victims were taken by force from their neighbours dwelling in Middle-earth, or amongst the faithful Numenorians under pretexts such as treason. But death did not depart from Numenor, rather it seemed to come sooner, more often, and with crueler conclusions. Whereas Numenorians before had grown slowly old with age and died peacefully in their sleep, now madness and sickness assailed them. This compounded their fear of death and they cursed themselves in their anguish. And it is said men slew one another for little cause in those days, were quick to anger fueled of course by Sauron and his followers, darkening the thoughts of others. It was not long before the people murmured against the king and the lords, or against the innocent. But even though this was happening, the Numenorians continued to prosper. They may not have increased in happiness, but they did grow stronger and richer as a nation. With the aid and counsel of Sauron, they devised engines and built ever greater ships, and they sailed now with power and armory to Middle-earth. 
and came no longer as bringers of gifts, nor even as rulers, but as fierce men of war. And they hunted the men of Middle-earth, and took their goods, and enslaved them, and many they slew cruelly upon their altars. Ar Farazon grew to be the mightiest tyrant that had yet been in the world since the reign of Morgoth, though in truth Sauron ruled all from behind the throne. But the years passed, and in the year 3310 SA, the king himself felt the shadow of death approaching him, even though he was only 192 years old. This ugly reminder of the Numenorians' shortening lifespan filled the king with more fear and wrath. Unsurprisingly, Melkor had not even answered his prayers. This is when Sauron made his final and most deadliest move. He incited the king, playing on his fears of death, to invade the undying lands and thus take immortality for himself from the Valar, on the grounds that their ban was imposed only to prevent the kings of men from surpassing them. He convinced him that the powerful and worthy king of Numenor could not be denied such a gift. The king must have been completely under Sauron's spell, because he began to prepare without hesitation, plans to create a great fleet to invade the blessed realm and claim his immortality. He was long preparing his design, and although he did not speak openly about it, somehow Armandil became aware of the king's purpose. He of course was filled with dread. He called his son Elendil to him, and revealed his plan to sail into the west to seek pardon and aid from Manwe, the lord of the Valar, before it's too late. Amandil met his preparations in secret to avoid punishment upon his house. He counseled his son to prepare ships to lie in the haven of Romena to escape when they saw their time. Retribution from the Valar lay in their hearts if the king was to go ahead with his plan. Upon his departure, Amandil pretended to sail east, a clever tactic to avoid suspicion, before he circled about to head west. He took with him three trusted servants, but he and they were never heard from again. The years moved on, but Elendil his son did all his father had asked, preparing their ships that lay on the east coast, readying the faithful and their heirlooms and a great store of goods. Many things there were of beauty and power, such as the Numenorians had conceived and obtained in the days of their wisdom, vessels and jewels, and scrolls of lore written in scarlet and black, and seven stones they had, a gift of the Eldar, the Palantiri, also known as Seeing Stones, and in the ship of Isildur was guarded the young tree, the scion of Nimloth, the fair, the tree of the king. The signs of the approaching doom were everywhere now. The weather turned hostile, ships sank in the sea, and out of the west there would come at times a great cloud in the evening, shaped as it were an eagle. Its wings spread from north to south, darkening all of Numenor, blotting out the sunset. Some men were afraid, others, including the king, became more resolved in their defiance. And some of the eagles bore lightning beneath their wings, and thunder echoed between sea and cloud, and men grew afraid. Behold the eagles of the lords of the west, they cried. The eagles of Manwe are come upon Numenor. Some Numenorian would repent for a time, but others hardened their hearts, and they shook their fists at heaven, 
saying, The lords of the west have plotted against us. They strike first. The next blow shall be ours. These words the king himself spoke, but they were devised by Sauron. The lightning storms increased and slew men upon the hills and in the fields and in the streets of the city. And a furious bolt of lightning struck the temple in which the king and Sauron performed their rituals, and it was wreathed in flame. But the temple was unshaken, and Sauron stood there upon the pinnacle and defied the lightning and was unharmed. When the people saw this, they acclaimed him as a god and ignored the final warnings when the land shook underneath them and smoke came out of the peak of Meneltamar where the hollow of Eru stood, blind and deaf to all signs. Ar Farazan continued building his fleet. His ships darkened the sea upon the west of the land and they were like an archipelago of a thousand isles. Their masts were as a forest upon the mountain, and their sails like a brooding cloud, and their banners were golden and black. It was the year 3319 SA when all was ready. All things waited upon the word of Ar Farazan. It was then that the final warning from the west emerged in the sky. The eagles of Manwe came up out of the dayfall, arranging themselves as if for battle, advancing in a line, the end of which diminished beyond sight. And as they came, their wings spread even wider, grasping the sky, and the west burned red behind them, and they glowed beneath as though they were lit with a flame of great anger, so that Numenor was illuminated as with a smouldering fire, and men looked upon the faces of their fellows, and it seemed to them that they were red with wrath. But the king hardened his heart to this omen, and went aboard his mighty ship, Alcarandas, which meant Castle of the Sea. He sat upon his throne, in full armour, and signalled for the rising of the anchors, and though there was little wind, they departed without delay. They had many oars and many strong slaves to row beneath the lash, and the Numenorean fleet moved west among the sound of loud trumpets, and thus it was when the land of gift disappeared on their eastern horizon they had at last broken the ban of the Valar. In the meantime, Elendil had remained in Romena, refusing the summons of the king when he set forth to war. He was forced to avoid the soldiers of Sauron that came to seize him and drag him to the fires of the temple. He went aboard his ship and stood off from the shore, waiting on the time. Sauron was wary himself of the possible consequences which may follow from the king's actions. He remained inside his temple, believing himself safe from their wrath, continuing to burn victims alive. It wasn't long before the Numenorean fleet surrounded Tol Eresea and anchored near the coast of Valinor, but the elves had already fled, all was silent and doom hung by a thread. At this point, Ar Farazon almost turned back at the imposing sight of the blessed realm and the great mountain of Taniquetil. But in the end, his pride won, and he disembarked and claimed the land. Manwe, the lord of the Valar, called upon Eru Iluvatar to take action, and in this moment, the Valar cast aside all remaining guardianship of the Numenorean people. And what happened next, not even Sauron could have foreseen. In the words of Tolkien, 
Iluvatar showed forth his power, and he changed the fashion of the world, and a great chasm opened in the sea between Numenor and the Deathless Lands, and the water flowed down into it, and the noise and the smoke of the cataracts went up to heaven, and the world was shaken, and all of the fleets of the Numenorians were drawn down into the abyss, and they were drowned and swallowed up forever. But Ar Farazan, the last king of Numenor, and the mortal warriors that had set foot upon the land of Aman, were buried under falling hills. There it is said, they will lie imprisoned in the caves of the Forgotten, until the last battle and the day of doom. The land of Aman and Eresea, the undying lands, were taken away and removed beyond the reach of men forever. And the Isle of Numenor, which was east of this great rift, in an hour unlooked for by men, this doom befell. Fire burst from the mountain of Meneltamar, and there came a mighty wind and a turmoil of the earth, and the sky reeled, and the hills slid, and Numenor went down into the sea, with all its children, and its wives, and its maidens, and its ladies proud, and all its gardens, and its balls, and its towers, its tombs and its riches, and its jewels, and its webs, and its things painted and carven, and its lore. They vanished forever. And last of all, the mountain wave, green and cold and plumed with foam, climbing over the land, took to its bosom Tar Miriel, the queen, fairer than silver or ivory or pearls. Too late, she strove to ascend the steep ways of the Maneltamar to the holy place, for the waters overtook her, and her cry was lost in the roaring of the wind. And so it was, the Isle of Numenor was lost, its beauty, its people, its glory destroyed, taken underneath the waves, never to return. Now, whether Armandil, in the end, made it to Valinor, and pleaded to Manwe to help his people, no one can be sure. Nevertheless, Elendil, his sons, and their people were spared from the ruin of this day, because when doom was finally upon them, a great wind took hold of their ships, wilder than any wind that men had known, roaring from the west, strong enough to snap their masts and rent their sails, tossing them about like straws upon the water. Nine ships they had, and after many days they were cast upon the shores of Middle-earth, shores which now had been altered greatly indeed by the great change of the world. The last fateful Numenorian had finally arrived on the shores of Middle-earth. Their home is lost forever, but this will not be their end. Sauron too had survived the ruin of Numenor. He was not of mortal flesh, but he was now robbed of his physical form, and never again would be able to take a fair form in the eyes of men. His spirit arose out of the deep, and passed as a shadow and a black wind over the sea, and came back to Middle-earth and to Mordor. There he took up again his great ring in Barad-dûr, and dwelt there, dark and silent, until he wove himself a new form, an image of malice and hatred made visible. Thus ends the life of Ar Farazan and the blessed isle known as Numenor. I hope you survived this long video. Now, where to begin? So many thoughts come to mind after I've completed this. Farazan started off so well, 
keeping a close friendship with Amandil in his youth. I had hoped it would have counted for something in the end. I pictured in my mind Armandil trying to reason with his old friend, convincing him not to follow through with his plan. But this, it seems, was never to be. The act of usurping Muriel and forcing her into marriage, the daughter of Tar Palantir, even though she was his first cousin, this is something I cannot wrap my head around. Numenorean law is normally so firm on these things. Sure, there was the usurping of the 18th King of Numenor by his father, but these circumstances were so different. This was a complete breach of Numenorean law. It's clear now the faithful that were still clinging onto the Council of Scepter had lost all say in the matter, and it truly reveals what kind of man Farazan was. He was just incredibly ambitious, single-minded, didn't care what people thought, and took what he wanted. Farazan truly inherited the worst elements of his father and his grandfather. The fact he was a great commander in Middle-earth, generous with his wealth, were not signs of a good man, just an ambitious man. And yet at the same time, although he did terrible things to the faithful and the folk of Middle-earth, he never moved upon the family of Amandil, and it's even possible he may have resisted the will of Sauron on this matter, which to me is the only redeeming factor of Farazan. It does not forgive what he did, but it is something. Sauron on the Isle of Numenor. I still can't get used to the idea. The moment he stepped onto Numenor, it was over. Well, at least he sped up the decline of the Numenorean people. There was a slim possibility Farazan could have offered Sauron to the Valar for judgment. It's understandable he didn't want anything to do with them, but surely his ambition would have tempted him. Maybe he could have offered Sauron to the Valar and gained a gift. Maybe he would have gotten his immortality. Who knows? It has me considering the factor that Sauron's abilities and the One Ring may have completely removed this idea from his head. I'm glad that the Faithful stuck it out as long as they did on the island, but in ways I wish they had taken more action in preventing Sauron from gaining so much influence on Numenor. It's hard to tell if the Faithful had any direct communication with the Eldar during this period, outside of actually leaving the Isle of Numenor. There was no words of warning from past Middle-earth allies by boat, bird, or even dream. <laughs> Nothing in respect of the One Ring and the threat of Sauron. It would seem clear that the remaining faithful had as much insight into the Rings of Power as the King did. It was wonderful to revisit the fall of Numenor. How it's described in the books is just beautiful. Heartbreaking, but beautiful. The final moments of Miriel, the last queen of Numenor, the rightful heir to the throne, is always heartbreaking. There was nothing she could do, of course. Eru and the Valar were in no mood to listen. Her father, Tar Palantir, had learned that during his reign. So the fact Farazan broke the ban and landed on the Undying Lands, claiming it for himself, wasn't the main reason for the closed hearts of the Valar. One must wonder why such a cataclysmic punishment was delivered by Eru Iluvatar to the Numenorians. Nothing before has triggered such a response. One could say it was overkill on his part. And to make matters worse, they let Sauron escape. Surely they were not blind to his influence on the Numenorian people. While Sauron was caught utterly by surprise at this cataclysmic outcome, he was not brought to judgment. His only punishment was that from then on, he was unable to assume a form that seemed fair to men. And I can't imagine this was part of any grand design by the Valar. It feels more like an oversight. Sauron just returned to Middle-earth, recovered his power with the One Ring, and plagued Middle-earth and 
the survivors of Numenor for another whole age. Farazan was truly a victim of his own deluded pride, I think. Spurred on by the lies of Sauron, who promised him no less than immortality and the kingship of the world if he stood against the Valar. When he attempted to claim his prize, he sealed his doom and that of his people. He grossly underestimated Sauron, something, unfortunately, the surviving blood of Numenor would have to learn again and again. And that's it, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this. It was a long one and some details I have left out, but I believe you will come away with a good overview of the story and the ruler. Moving forward, I will continue to follow the line of Numenor. Perhaps remake a few of my older videos to repair some pronunciations and lore, but always staying true to the path I have set out. There are so many cultural insights I wish to share and things I wish to explore. I'm considering making some non-Numenorean related videos too and live stream, but I haven't decided just yet on the content, but I will keep you posted. If you like this, please like, subscribe and comment. Goodbye for now.